Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Clairbout, speaking to you from Stanford, where I'm attending the uh, first and second year students while the rest of the gang is down in Houston. Um, got a, some interesting stories to tell you what we're doing here. Uh, in a nutshell, I'm going to say, if you, if you deconvolve with the correct wavelet, then when you get your seismic section out, it's got, the polarity is going to become much more apparent. I'll be talking a lot about the Ricker wavelet, which has three lobes, first lobe, second lobe, and third lobe. And there's an analytic expression for this guy, which is the second derivative of a Gaussian. Here's some field data, and if you look down here, you'll see uh, black, white, black. That's a, a signature of a Gaussian. We see the same signature on the top of the salt here, black, white, black. And the bottom of the salt is not quite so easy to see. It's white, black, white. And uh, what's happening when we process this is we're going to turn this Ricker wavelet into a spike. And so here it is. It's become a white spike. And now when you look at this data, it's much more apparent to, especially to, to a geophysicist. Interpreters could figure this out easily all along, but they'll see, oh, the top of the salt has the same polarity as the water bottom, and the bottom of the salt has the opposite polarity. And this data set is really fun because we see black events, we see white events, Here's another black event. I really like the black events because their indication that Earth is getting softer, whereas normally it's getting harder. I'll blink back and forth a few times, and you will uh, recognize that it's possible to recognize all these polarities on the original data. It's just that they're much more clear after you've properly deconvolved. Oh, I forgot to mention this, uh, this orange dot is, is a bubble. Okay, so I took uh, 1,000 Gulf of Mexico traces from a line, and I computed their spectra. I averaged the spectra. I computed a decon filter for the average spectra. I took its inverse, and I got what should be the shot waveform, but it's not. As you can see, it's not a Ricker wavelet. This third lobe is really small. So we've been making this assumption for 55 years. So really, what's going on? Have we been goofing up that long? I think so. Well, using the same amplitude spectrum, I can find a different phase spectrum, which is not causal. There's something leaking out here before t equals zero. And uh, this is a Ricker wavelet, and it's got all the bubbles on it. I'm going to tell you how to get this. So why does it reveal the polarity better? Well, if you deconvolve with the right wavelet, then the seismic polarity, polarity is obviously revealed. Industry has been doing, typically does this stuff in the time domain here, and they have a process that computes in n-squared time. And you may have heard the names uh, Wiener Levinson or John Berg, Anders Robinson, Sven Tritel. I typically do this stuff in the frequency domain. It's faster, but that's not the reason. Uh, there's an old math, Russian mathematician figured this theory out a long time ago. Uh, I've published it in my first textbook, and the code is out there. And so this is pretty well known. Anyway, you don't have to struggle to learn this. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to adopt the Kolmogorov method, I call it the Kolmogorov method, to be Ricker compliant. So uh, we can parameterize a, uh, the logarithm of a filter in the time domain or the frequency domain. What's this? Here's the amplitude spectrum. Here's the phase spectrum of the filter. This says we can use Z-transforms, but they're secretly, they're Fourier sums. Uh, here's our filter amplitude and phase. We can push the amplitude up into the exponent, but we put a logarithm up there. Now, if we, we take this Fourier sum from this time domain, brings us back to the frequency domain. So this, this uh, tau space here is a, it's a lag space, so it's not really an autocorrelation that you have up here. It, it doesn't Fourier transform to a spectrum. It Fourier transforms to a log spectrum. That makes it a little bit different. Uh, so starting from this log spectrum, we can split this thing into even and odd parts. And the even part uh, is, of course, the spectrum of R is even, and the log spectrum is even, and this R has an even part. And that's, uh, those are all connected. And that's given, and we, we don't change the even part. The odd part, however, is, uh, is where the phase comes from. Mr. Komogorov says, why don't you take this U function to be causal, uh, make it vanish before t equals 0. And so if you look before t equals 0, the even part and the odd part have to cancel each other. And that, that defines for you the odd part. OK, that's great. We like it. Uh, we used it a lot, and we continue to use it. But Mr. Ricker says, let's start from where you left off, and let's change it a little bit. Let's change the phase a little bit. 
at small legs, let's just suppress that phase a little bit. Let's just damp it down a little bit. Okay, here's what happens. You have to choose a width for the zone in which you're going to damp it down. So here we're going to go from zero up to half a second in factors of two. If we, and we got in the middle here, we got three of them that are pretty good. So we start at the top. This is a causal minimum phase wavelet right here. And we start, uh, start dampening down the phase near zero lag. And all of a sudden, we hit a good one here. This is a pretty good Ricker wavelet once we've damped down 32 milliseconds. I actually damp it down with a, with a sine squared function. So it's, uh, from the end of that arrow, it goes down as a sine squared to the center here. It comes back up as a sine squared there. So I'm going to say, roughly speaking, 60 milliseconds is fine. Really, anything between 32 and 128 is kind of OK. Now, when you, when you go down to very large uh, gaps of, of weakening the phase, something bad happens. Uh, you see what happens, we get a bump out here. What this really is, is it's the bubble. Some of the bubble has moved to the left side. We don't want any of this. Okay, so that works really good. Uh, to, if you have anybody's deconvolution filter, you can make it reveal polarity better. You can make it respect the Ricker wavelet, Ricker's concept. All you have to do is, I have it in 16 words here. If you walk out of the room and you want to remember what I said, just told you in 16 words, grab its phase spectrum, Bring it into the time domain, near zero lag, damp it down. That's it. Now that polarity means some, we can all agree that white means hard and black means soft. But maybe in some companies you do it the other way around. So just tell me and we'll start to do it your way. Why didn't we figure this out 40 years ago? Well, 40 years ago everybody got interested in migration. And I did too. Now there's two uses for this Ricker trick I'm telling you today. One, the one that I'm using is I just use it as it is to modify conventional deconvolution. Antoine is doing sparsity deconvolution. Now, when I say to Antoine, I say, Antoine, your sparseness code gives better polarities than my uh, ordinary decon. And Antoine says to me, John, your Ricker code is much easier to choose the parameters. Okay, so let's talk about choosing the parameters. So here's something new that I'm just revealing to you in public for the first time to you folks today. Uh, parameters are more intuitive in lag log equivalency space, and here's why. So here's our filter, and we've gone through the Kolmogorov process, and we got these U's, and then we got this Z transform sum. We can break this sum into three parts. Let's call these these terms the A, B, and C terms. Here's A, here's B, here's C. It's like it's like three filters operating one right after the other, kind of independently from one another. And I have to choose where to break the sum. I have to break it here, and I have to break it here. The break here is the easiest one to explain. This just tells us if you're just dealing with this sum, you're talking about the bubble. If I want to get rid of bubbles, and I'm going to show you some great bubbles that I've gotten rid of in some really modern data. If you want to get rid of bubbles, I just need these terms. So I, I just neglect the A and the B. I just set A and B equal to 0 and have E to the C. So here's a wavelet. I just divide out E to the C out of the field data, and you get really nice bubble removal. This part B has to do with getting rid of Rickard wavelets and turning them into spikes. Uh, you've already seen some of that. And this part uh, A is kind of a high frequency cutoff, but it's not expressed in the frequency domain. It's expressed in the lag domain. It's, it's kind of like the precision. How, 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 where's the camera? How sharp a resolution are you really trying to see on the time axis? You can see we're just going to use the inner, the inner couple of lags on that. So you can apply a weighting function there to limit high frequency. If you don't want to see 250 hertz on your data, you can put a little weighting function in there. Okay, let's go and look at some uh, results, which I think are really delightful. Uh, we have here, uh, from the Gulf of Mexico, we see there's lots of bubbles down here, and the bubbles are being lifted right off. It's really clean once those bubbles are all gone. And we can uh, see, we can actually find bubbles all over the place. If I speed it up a little bit, you'll notice that there's a long bubble in here, and it goes way over here, and it's down here. See the bubble over here? Bubbles everywhere. Uh, this is the best example I got. So I like to say this is a textbook case. But actually, Similar phenomenon on every data set that we've had so far. I'm going to show you the three other data sets that we have. 
That was the Gulf of Mexico. This is the Gulf of California, Cabo San Lucas. And you can see this bubble coming through here all over the place. Uh, there's another one down in here, a little weaker. And there's lots of bubbles over here. Where are there strong events or bubbles? Right here, the bubble is interfering with interesting primaries and things. Uh, this one is Coast, stands for Cascadia. Cascadia, what is it? Open access seismic transects. We can see they have their share of bubbles too, but they don't have as many. Now the next we got some really high quality data from Chevron recently from Australia. And if I slow this down, I don't know what the best speed is to see. Uh, there's bubbles coming off in here. And uh, you might say, which one is the bubble? Which frame has got the bubble on it? I'm afraid we don't have a lot of time, but I'll just uh, zoom you in. You can start to look at that and decide which frame has got the bubble on it to your estimation. You can look up here too, whichever you look at. I'll zoom it back out and you can figure out if you've been observing the correct frame as having bubble on it. Okay, well that's all very gratifying. That seems to work very well. Uh, I want to show you some more later on that they, these Chevron people in Australia are doing a good job of, of getting rid of the bubble compared to the other folks. This plot I really like. Uh, before I forget it, let's look at the Chevron Australia. There's very little bubble down here. There is some lower frequency. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to try and pull out, but here it's below the axis here. It's above the axis here. So this is the strictly causal uh, deconvolution here. These are, and this is the rigor compliant. And we, we're going to look at all these. Uh, I don't know where to start. Uh, the thing to notice is, and this is kind of shocking, which I mentioned earlier, the third lobe is simply not here. It's really narrow, it's just short. <laughs> and uh, that's the Gulf of Mexico. Here we have the Gulf of California, same story, not quite as bad. And this is uh, Chevron Australia data, which I'm sure they're doing a beautiful job. Look how the second lobe is big and wide and tall. And the third lobe is just tiny compared to the first lobe. So that's a surprise, isn't it? It's a surprise for me. And this is uh, Cascadia, which is off the coast of Oregon. Uh, okay, so that's that's quite amazing, interesting, I think. Now, uh, I started looking at the constant Q of, of the Earth and what are the impulse responses of waves going through, an impulse propagating through a constant Q Earth. You might think this is a big change of topic, but I uh, hope you can see this equation here. If the In a constant Q Earth, the damping is just proportional to the distance, the number of wavelengths propagated, so the number of wavelengths propagated is given by this expression. Tau is just the quality of the earth factor times the distance that you've gone through. So, so you're kind of given a, a power spectrum, and it's easy for me, it's trivial for me to, to uh, compute the causal waveform that's connected with that. <clears throat> oh, Mr. Futterman would have been very happy to know, have this uh, fast Fourier transform trick and, and a Kolmogorov trick. He could have made a more beautiful plot like I have right here of a constant Q propagation. This is just through one single layer inside the Earth and what you get back. Now, if you have a whole bunch of layers at all different depths, then there'll be some shallower ones and they'll give you more higher frequencies. And that's why you have this many layers, you have this sharp arrival here. So uh, the next thing that happened is I applied a ghost function. I said there's shots at six meters depth and receivers at nine meters depth. That's two pixels versus three pixels. And this is what came out. So so basically, the ghost operation is kind of like a second derivative. And it really surprised me that I didn't get three lobes. Because remember, the, the Ricker wavelet is defined by the second derivative of a Gaussian. These, these curves look kind of Gaussian, don't they? But their second derivative looks not at all like a Ricker wavelet. The third lobe is just absolutely tiny here. You can hardly see it. So why was that? I mean, I was really puzzled by that. But I'm going to explain it to you now. It's got a really simple explanation. Pretend this is a Gaussian. It's actually a triangle, but it's a tilted triangle because we need to talk about tilted Gaussians where the high frequencies are at the beginning and the low frequencies are at the end. It's easy to see if you take the second derivative of that, you get a spike here, 
the second spike is a lot bigger, and the third spike you could easily miss if things were smoothed out. So you take the second derivative of this curve, and it looks like you've taken the first derivative. <laughs> okay, that's just uh, that's just the way the cookie crumbled. Now, uh, well, here you see those curves again. Okay, well, uh, we got to saying let's look at some field data, and I don't have time to analyze this all, and you can think of. Well, the, the, uh, the water bottom here, the multiple here. Um, we're starting to think about, oh gosh, is this the, what, what really is the third lobe here? If you draw, if you had a, an axis line in here, you'd say maybe the third lobe is kind of wide. That this little bump in the middle is a soil layer, which keeps changing. It's not really clear there, is it? Uh, this is Gulf of Mexico. This one is, this looks like a, a genuine Ricker wavelet. Now we're going to look at the top of the salt next. When we look at the top of the salt, the third lobe is bigger. Now why is that? No, I don't know if I know the reason for that. Okay, so uh, let's. Uh, now I'm sure you'd like me to give you a summary. Uh, where does how does all the pieces of the puzzle fit together? And I would like to give you that summary, but I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> All I'm doing is teaching the youngsters how to use all these tools. And then they can study the data and they'll tell you how the whole puzzle fits together. Here we thought we had it figured out 50 years ago and we didn't. So what we need now is more data. We're looking for some two millisecond marine seismic lines. We do not need to know precisely where they're located. We love it if they have salt on them. We offer free results and free codes. What we don't like is dealing with intellectual property lawyers who make us sign all kinds of things and make us deal with our own Stanford lawyers. Okay, so I'd like to acknowledge again Antoine Guiton, who is work, working with me on the uh, sparseness deconvolution. And, uh, and I, of course, I need to acknowledge the sponsors who have given us all this data. Sponsors and other organizations have given us this data. We'd certainly like more. And thank you all for your support. Hooray for your support. Uh, if I've been talking kind of fast today, if you'd like a repeat of it, you can go to YouTube and you can see my last practice talk, which was probably about a week ago. Let's try it now. Uh, where is it? It's here somewhere. What you have to do is you go to YouTube, which I've got here, and we'll type in John Clairbaud practice talk. And here comes some practice talks. Here's one. Let's try this one. John Clairbaut, I've come to tell you. Okay, you've seen enough of me story. now. <laughs> so I'm going to say goodbye. Mm -hmm.